Welcome back. Last segment, we defined three orbital regions, low Earth, medium Earth, and geosynchronous orbits. In this segment, our goal is to come up with a few general rules which govern these orbits. Once we have these rules, we'll focus again on those three orbital regions, but this time armed with a way of quantifying what we see. So taking a look at the animation that we looked at last segment, what do you notice? The first thing you might see is that objects are moving in roughly circles. And maybe they aren't perfect circles, but slightly squashed. A squashed circle is called an ellipse. So if we state that all orbits are ellipses, we include circles as part of this. The flip side of that statement is that orbiting satellites don't trace out squares or triangles or zigzag all over the place. And while that feels obvious, it didn't have to be that way. An important property of an orbit is that it traces out an ellipse in space. Examining this animation again, the second thing to notice is the time it takes to complete one orbit. We'll call this the orbital period. The orbital period increases the further you go from Earth. That is, if you look kind of closely, objects orbiting nearest to Earth complete a full orbit faster than objects orbiting further out. There's a relationship between the distance from Earth and the orbital period. So these two observations were actually made a long time ago. The first person to describe orbits in this way was Johannes Kepler over 400 years ago. Kepler came up with these rules or laws to study the motion of the visible planets around the sun. We now know that his laws apply more generally to anything orbiting around another thing. So the rules that govern planets orbiting the sun also govern satellites orbiting around the Earth. Kepler proposed three laws of orbital motion. His first law is exactly the same as ours. Orbits are ellipses. And at the time, it was assumed that things orbit on perfect circles. And it's odd to think about now, but at the time, proposing that orbits could be ellipses and not circles was totally revolutionary. The idea was that circles are perfect and anything in the sky was also perfect. And so planets orbiting the sun must orbit on perfect circles. The problem here is that if you assume planets orbit in perfect circles, it's impossible to correctly predict their positions. Kepler made what seems like a slight adjust adjustment and was all of a sudden able to predict the positions of planets in the sky with amazing accuracy. Kepler's second law describes the speed at which an object moves in its orbit. And we'll skip this one for now, but briefly, an object in a circle has the same speed throughout its orbit. For an ellipse, the speed is faster in the inner regions of the orbit compared to the outer. The final third law is what we need right now. Kepler's third law provides a relationship between the orbital period of an object and its distance from the thing it's orbiting. And this is an equation. The equation says exactly what we've already noticed. The orbital period of objects increases the further you are from Earth. And this equation is super useful. So if you give me the orbital period of a satellite, I can tell you how far away it is or vice versa. To write this out, we need to describe our system in a little bit more detail. Suppose we have a satellite orbiting Earth. We can label a couple of things. So first, let's label the mass of the Earth. We'll represent the mass of Earth as a letter M. This is a number we know we can look up the mass of the Earth in kilograms or pounds or whatever you like. The next thing we can label is the distance a satellite is away from the Earth. And we'll call this distance the semi-major axis. If an orbit is a perfect circle, the semi-major axis is exactly its radius. But if we squish that circle into an ellipse, the equivalent quantity is called the semi-major axis. And either way, we're going to label this quantity with the letter A. The final thing we need to describe an orbit is the orbital period. How long does it take a satellite to come back to its starting point? We'll represent the orbital period with the letter P. So Kepler's third law provides us a relationship between these three quantities. His third law states that A cubed equals P squared M. And there's some values that are constant that we're skipping, but this is enough to see that if you're orbiting around an object with some mass m, if you give me the orbital distance of the satellite a, I can use this equation to tell you its orbital period, p. Conversely, if I can measure the orbital period of a satellite, I can use this equation to determine how far away it is. It's kind of like magic.
in, actually to Kepler, it was sort of magic. He knew that these laws worked, but he didn't understand why they worked. It would take another 150 years for Isaac Newton to come along and realize that Kepler was describing how an object moves under gravity. That is, Kepler's laws are a special case of Newton's gravity. In my graduate class, I start with the equation for Newton's gravity and derive Kepler's laws for orbital motion. It's really cool and it takes several pages of math and it includes the appearance of a creepy clown. But anyway, Kepler's third law will be useful as we explore the various orbital regions around Earth. Okay, so let's use Kepler's third law in a specific example to calculate the orbital distance of Sputnik. Sputnik was the first artificial satellite to orbit the Earth. It was launched in 1957 by the Soviet Union. The only payload on this satellite was a small radio transmitter. And if you had a radio receiver anywhere under the orbit of Sputnik, you could receive the signal and detect it going overhead. In the United States, ham radio operators could clearly hear this transmission. So the transmission would last a few minutes and then it would repeat a little while later as the satellite orbited. And by waiting for when the transmission repeated, it was fairly easy to measure the orbital period of Sputnik. The satellite orbited the Earth every 96.2 minutes. Just with this information and Kepler's third law, it's possible to calculate how high above the Earth's surface Sputnik was orbiting. And you can imagine this as the very first artificial satellite. It might be something that you really want to know. So looking at Kepler's equation, we have measured P, the orbital period, and we know the mass of the Earth, M. And so it's just a matter of multiplying these values to get the semi-major axis, A. And I admit we're lightly skimming the surface here. To really use the equation, we need to make sure the units are right and put some constants out front. And if you're interested, we'll provide an optional deeper dive into this calculation at the end of the module. Trusting for me for a minute on the math, this equation tells us that Sputnik orbited 600 kilometers above the Earth's surface. This is amazing, right? We just figured out by measuring the orbital period of a satellite how high it is above the Earth. And if we go back to the definitions from last segment, an orbital height of 600 kilometers puts Sputnik in a low Earth orbit. Next segment, we'll focus more on low Earth orbits and discuss the pros and cons of putting satellites there. But as a preview, one of the cons of low Earth orbit is that there are still trace amounts of Earth's atmosphere in this region that cause satellites to lose orbital energy. And because Sputnik was in a low Earth orbit on a bit of an elliptical orbit, it was dragged back down into Earth's atmosphere, burning up within about three months after launch, but certainly not before it sparked the space race of the 1960s and beyond. So now we have the tools in the form of Kepler's laws to better understand orbits. We will apply these in the next segment to low Earth orbits.